For the motion, we have Dr. Anja Sophia Peterson from the Danish Headache Center. Welcome, Anja. And against the motion, we have Dr. Kwang Po Peng. He can hear you, he can see you, but we can't see him right now. But please give him a hand. So, Dr. Peterson has been at the Danish Headache Center for quite a while, is despite her young age. And I do believe she published her first paper related to cluster headache a decade ago. So while most of us were still, at least in our age group, were still studying medicine and trying to understand basic physiology, Anya Peterson was already publishing her first papers on cluster headache. So we have a strong opponent today. And Dr. Kwang Po Peng is educated and studied or did research in Taiwan under Professor Xu Yin Wang. And then in 2018, he got the IHS fellowship and then relocated to Hamburg, where he's currently uh, doing research with Professor Arne May. In particular, Dr. Kwang Po Peng is doing research in sensory cyclic uh, differences in, I believe, headache disorders in general, and with the use of neuroimaging in particular. So, just so we go through the format again. You have seen this a few times by now, but just for those who have not. So the debate format starts with an initial vote before any of the debaters state their arguments. Then we have the opening remarks, where first for the motion goes on, that would be Dr. Peterson, and then against the motion goes on, which would be Dr. Peng. After that, we will have a second vote for or against the motion. After the second vote, we'll have an intra-panel discussion where the two debaters ask and answer each other's questions for 10 minutes. And I will be trying to moderate it so they don't get too, um, can I say, too fierce or too aggressive against each other. Following the inter-panel discussions, we will then open up for questions and answers from the audience, both in person and online. And then the debaters are allowed to have the closing remarks, approximate two minutes each. Following the closing remarks, we'll have the final vote. And when the vote count is over, we'll present the three different vote sessions, the three different results. All right. So thank you for being here today. And I think we should just begin with the initial vote. So Dr. Christensen, if you would uh, help me. So to access the vote, you have to go to iCamps2022.com. And there you will see this little function when you enter the chat. Migraine and cluster headache are two different disorders. You then click the vote button. And you will then have a choice for or against the motion. So please log on to iCamps2022.com, enter the chat with your name, click the vote button, and cast your vote for or against the motion. And the motion is migraine and cluster headache are two distinct disorders, for or against. So we will have two, three minutes before we continue. And I think I'll just ask a question to Dr. Peterson because I know you've been very busy this weekend. I believe you also went to a different conference yesterday, is that true? Yes. So you're already a bit warmed up uh, for presenting. Yes. Yeah. And uh, how was it yesterday? Well, it was, uh, it was nice. It was an uh, annual uh, society meeting for neurologist in Denmark. It was very cozy and <laughs> we had a great dinner and there was a, a theater group performing and it was, it was really nice. But, but I went to bed early and I'm fresh today. <laughs> no hangover. Oh. But what about the scientific content yesterday? How was that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we learned a lot. Uh, I have not been in the general neurology department for many years. I've been specializing in headaches. So I learned uh, a lot about uh, autoimmune encephalitis um, and some about uh, myasthenia gravis as well. So, uh, and I also learned that it's quite hard to diagnose 
neurology disorders. Aside from headache. Aside from headache, yeah. <laughs> so, Kwang Po Peng, can you still hear us? I can still hear you. Yeah, great. How was your How has your weekend been? Been uh, working as usual? Uh, somehow like that. And uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can definitely hear you. Okay. Yeah, but the weekend is. It was a little bit hard for me because I have to. I thought I had to do the meeting with two kids aside, but uh, fortunately, my wife took the kids out, so now I'm alone at home, which is good. Okay, Kwang Po, how long time do we have before your wife is back? I hope enough time. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Otherwise, they can participate in the discussion. Maybe they can even cast a couple of votes in your favor. Uh, hope not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rune, are we ready? Okay, I think we should begin with the next part of the debate then. So, we are continuing into the opening remarks. So, Dr. Peterson, if you will take the stage. Yes. And please give Anya a hand. So the stage is yours, Anya. You may begin. Perfect. So thank you for inviting me and to talk about this interesting topic. My name is Anya, and I'm here to convince you that cluster headache and migraine are two separate disorders. So the central word in this debate is distinct, which means that something can be similar, but it can or should be separate from the other. Allow me to take an example from the animal kingdom. So both have a mouth and a nose, and they look fairly similar. They have an ear, which is also fairly similar. They have yellow, frightening eyes. But when you zoom out, you see that one is a lion, and one is a tiger. So they, they look alike, they, uh, but they are clearly different animals. They live on different continents. They have different lifestyles. One lives in packs, one lives alone. So similarities are okay, but they are still different. This will lead us into the headaches. Many neurologists have not seen a cluster headache, a full-blown attack, but it is very distinct. It will take you a maximum of two seconds to put the diagnosis, cluster headache. The patient will walk around fiercely, rubbing their eye. Maybe you want to try, you're a young neurologist, you go in there and say, hey, I want to do a neuro neurological exam on you, and they will yell at you. Trust me. So. This is cluster headache. The migraine patients in the emergency room, you go in, they are in the dark, everything is quiet, and they will participate in your neurological examination, although a bit affected, but they will participate. So the behavior is completely different. And this moves more on to the entire clinical specter. So, as we agreed, the behavior is totally different. We also have some, uh, some publications that they are different. And then we have the pain. In cluster headache, the pain is side-locked. It is strictly unilateral in retroorbital pain. In migraine, the pain is more diffuse. It is often not side-locked. And around 40% says that they have a bilateral headache. Then we have the associating symptoms. The aura is only in migraine. It has been speculated to be part of, of cluster headache, but Kwang Po, my counterpart today, he has just published a study in which he has found that it is an epiphenomena for the uh, aura. Uh, com uh, it's a comorbid migraine with aura. Then we have the autonomic symptoms, which are the hallmark of cluster headache. Well, some Migraine patients have autonomic symptoms, but they are less pronounced. Often a cluster headache patient will have maybe five, where the migraine patient has only one, and it's not always side-locked. It could also be bilateral. So moving on to what kind of disease is this? So migraine 
it's very, very prevalent. 15% of the entire population suffers from this headache. Whereas cluster headache, although not rare in neurology, it is not as common as migraine. It's only 0.1%. So clear difference there. And we have the complete opposite sex ratios. So in, in cluster headache, you have three men to one woman. And the complete is, is the opposite is true for migraine. So there, there is three women for one man. So, and the prevalence of migraine in the cluster headache population is 13% in numerous cases, which is completely relatable to the general population. We also have some genetic studies on both migraine and cluster headache. And the geneticists, they have like this correlation where zero is no association and one is a complete association. And a recent DIVA study in cluster headache found that there was not a significant association in between migraine and cluster headache. We know of uh, 38 migraine-associated loci, which has been associated by GVASs. And in a recent cluster headache study, 36 of them had nothing to do with cluster headache. One was unfortunately not picked up in the GVASs in cluster headache. And there was, well, there was one that was uh, a common factor, and, and this was uh, in code for a 5HL5 gene, which is, has been linked to a tryptin response. So no, no similarities there either. And moving on to pathophysiology. This is perhaps uh, the place where you'll find the most similarities in between cluster headache and migraine. Um, neuroimaging studies have, however, uh, showed that there's an activation in the dorsal lateral pons in, in migraine, which has never been found in cluster headache. There we see an activation of the hypothalamus during the pain phase. They do share the trigeminal vascular system. And, um, oh, sorry. You shouldn't see that, that was my point. And <laughs> so, but one thing that they have strongly in common is the opening statement in the recent Lancet Primer uh, in the pathophysiology sections. And that is that we simply do not understand these disorders. We don't have the complete pictures yet. So therefore, and I'm sure that Kwang Po will make it great argument here that they are similar, but we should not put our rely on this because we have a preliminary understanding. So in here we find no argumentations. And moving on to the treatments, we see that oxygen and SPG neurostimulation, they both inhibit the parasympathetic branch of the trigeminal vascular reflex. This will treat a cluster headache attack, but it will not treat a migraine attack. We have this, the, the new era of the <laughs> monoclonal antibodies, and they have been robustly effective in migraine trials. In cluster headache trials, we have always also tried these, but only one in four has been uh, positive, and that was with a p-value of 0 0.04, so just barely positive. And uh, remapamil is not really used in migraine. There's been some trials, but it has been, well, it's not mentioned in any guidelines, and the trials are very old and very underpowered. The tryptans, however, is a similarity in between cluster headache and migraine. They are both effective in treating an attack. So, we come to the conclusion are migraine and cluster headache two separate disorders? Well, as a clinician, I can tell you, I used many, many, many hours interviewing both migraine patients and cluster headache patients. They do look different. They recapitalize differently. And yes, 
there is a similarity, the headaches. But generally speaking, one is man, one is female. They come from different planets, that being Mars and Venus. So they are completely separate. So, and uh, I'm sure that Kwang Po will, will counteract this in a moment, but this has been my argumentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. And now we are moving to Kwang Po Peng's opening statements. So his opening statements are pre-recorded to reduce technical challenges, but afterwards he will uh, interact directly on Zoom. So just a moment while we put on the video. Good afternoon. My name is Juan Bopin from the University Medical Center, Hamburg, Eppendorf. Today, I'm going to join my colleague, Dr. Peterson, on this debate topic. Migraine and cluster headache are two distinct disorders. My position is against this motion. I'm going to use the next 10 minutes to convince you that migraine and cluster headache are not two distinct disorders. First, we're going to talk about the phenotype of both cluster headache and migraines. At first glance, both seem to be two different disorders. Cluster is featured by the short lasting attack up to three hours, and migraine, on the other hand, is featured by headache attacks starting from four hours up to three days. And cranial autonomic symptoms CAS is the defining feature for cluster headache. However, 50% of the migraine patients, they also have CAS. Our migraine and cluster headache really less mutually exclusive. Some patients, they have the intermediate phenotype. For example, on the left-hand side, we have some cluster headache patients that have the typical feature. For example, they have the attack duration more than three hours, and they also have typical visual aura. And on the other hand, we have some migraine patients with a typical CAS. They are more likely to have unilateral headaches. And in the middle, we also have some patients who fulfill the diagnosis criteria for probable migraine and so probable cluster headache. So the clinical phenotype of both disorder, except for the attack duration, is actually overlapped. For example, univalvular pain, severe intensity, allodynia, photophonophobia, interictal sensitivity, and also CAS. So that is my first argument. The phenotype is not really that different between both disorders. And when we look into the data of pharmacological provocation studies, this study come primarily from our Danish colleagues, and this study provides invaluable information on the mechanism of migraine attacks. Various triggers has different provocation rate and suggests a different role in the signaling cascade in the treadmill vascular system. And what we learned from this study is that this trigger not only trigger headaches, but they trigger migraine-like headaches, the mechanism is rather specific. But nearly all of these triggers, they can be used to trigger cluster headache attacks. Of course, the onset and the duration between migraine and cluster headache still differ, but that suggests the biological mechanism of headache in both migraine and cluster headache is to a certain degree overlapped. And this is my second argument. And here is a really nice illustration on the migraine pharmacological triggers. Nearly all of the upstream compound has been shown to trigger cluster headache as well. For example, CGRP, PARCAP, nitroglycerin. And downstream in this cascade, I believe almost everyone knows this important study on KATP and also BKCA. Both of them, they are really strong trigger for migraine attacks. And I'm looking forward to see the results of decromacaline and also Maxipost in patients with cluster headaches. I believe they will provide better understanding of the mechanism of cluster headache attacks. And when we look into migraine and cluster headaches, both disorders, they are not only headache disorders. Both are featured by a pre phase before the headache starts. On the right hand side, we have this famous illustration from Blau. Before the headache starts, patient has already developed a craving, yawning, highlight, 
heightened perception or free retention in certain premonitory symptoms. And on the left hand side, in recently published study from our Danish colleagues, we also seen that patients with cluster headache, they also have parasympathetic activation, neck pain, photophonophobia, concentration difficulty before the headache starts. The main difference from the left hand side and the right hand side is only the time frame. The symptom is somehow similar. So the presence of the premonitory symptoms suggests that there is a generator in the brain and the generator has already started even before the headache appears. And this is my third argument. If something has already started before the headache attacks, the next question is where is the generator? On the left hand side, we have the functional MRI study. My one patient, they have a stronger activation of the posterior hypothalamus during the attack compared to the interictal phase. And the right upper corner, we have the early PET study. And this study, cluster headache patient, they also have the posterior hypothalamus activation during the attack. And this has been replicated in a later functional MRI study. So when this patient with migraine are examined longitudinally, the activation of posterior hypothalamus can be as early as two days before the attack. That further reinforced the idea of the posterior hypothalamus as the generator or at least one generator for the headache attacks in both disorders. And this is my fourth argument. Hypothalamus is more than a generator in both disorders. On the left hand side, we have patient with migraine. Patient with chronic migraine compared to control, they have a stronger activation in the anterior hypothalamus. And on the right hand side, in patient with chronic cluster headache, they also have a similar activation in the anterior hypothalamus compared to the control group. This suggests that the anterior hypothalamus is associated with chronification of both diseases. We just mentioned that posterior hypothalamus might be the generator and anterior hypothalamus might be associated with the chronicity. My fifth argument is the specific treatment response in both disorders. Here, I've summarized some of the specific treatments in both migraine and episodic cluster headaches. For example, tryptans, tryptans are the well-established first-line therapy in both migraine and episodic cluster headaches. And to the best of my knowledge, tryptans do not work against the other headache disorders. CGRP monoclonal antibody is the emerging therapy for migraine, and one clinical trial has shown efficacy of gaikanilumab in preventing episodic cluster headache. And the study with fremanilumab was early terminated. And when it comes to oxygen, oxygen is the well-established treatment for cluster headache, but one randomized control trial has also shown an efficacy in patients with migraine. Steroid is a well-established bridging therapy for episodic cluster headache. And in patients with migraine, it's usually used to treat status migranosis. Topiramid is the well-established preventative therapy in patients with migraine. In an open-label study, has also shown some efficacy in patients with cluster headache. Melatonin has been investigated in more than two randomized controlled trials and has shown some efficacy against migraine. And one randomized controlled trial has also shown an efficacy of melatonin against episodic cluster headache. Non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation is a new treatment option and has been shown in randomized controlled trial that can be used to abort migraine attack or to prevent episodic cluster headache. When it comes to sphenopalatine ganglion modulation, in one sham controlled trials, SPG block is superior to sham block in preventing chronic migraine. And SPG stimulation has been shown effective in treating patients with chronic cluster. The mechanism of action is rather specific for these treatment options. So, the clinical efficacy for both of these disorders suggests the partially overlapped disease mechanism. This is my fifth argument. I'm going to use this slide to summarize. Are migraine and cluster headache two distinct disorders? When we look into the dictionary, distinct means clearly separate and different from something else. 
This is how two distinct disorders look like. However, when it comes to migraine against cluster headache, both of them, they have shared clinical presentation, they have shared pharmacological triggers, they have shared response to specific medication or to neuromodulation. They also have a shared generator or shared brain activation that is the posterior hypothalamus as a trigger or a generator and anterior thalamus as a disease chronicity. So I'm not trying to convince anyone here that both of them are the same disorder, but our topic of debate is are they two distinct disorders? Based on all the similarity between migraine and cluster headache, I'm going to argue against this motion. They are not two distinct disorders. So please vote for no. Thank you to so Dr. Peng. Let's give him a hand. Okay, so we are now moving into the second vote. And Rone, if you may. And Kwang Po, are you still with us? Great. So in just a brief moment, we will enter the intra-panel discussion where you and Anya will uh, engage in a debate as moderated by me. And so let's just finish the vote. So the vote is now open on ICANS2022.com. If you go on the website and click vote, you will get the option to choose for or against the motion. And the motion, just to repeat, Migraine and cluster headache are two distinct disorders, yes or no. While we are casting a vote, I think I asked the moderator should ask both of you a question or actually add some data to your discussion. So, Kwang Po, you touched on the provocation and said that that's an argument for uh, migraine and cluster headache not being two distinct disorders. But I think you might forget that we also have done this in post-traumatic headache that CGRP can induce or provoke the same symptoms as the patients usually report in prosomatic headache. And CGRP antibodies have also been tested in patients with post-traumatic headache. So now the question is for both of you. Anja, how would you use this data as an argument for the motion? And Kwang Po, how would you use this data as an argument against the motion? I'll give you two minutes to think about it while we're waiting for the vote to end. We have 30 seconds left of the vote. And I see Dr. Peterson uh, is writing down notes, Kwangpo. Maybe you should be a bit worried. I'm typing my notes. Ah, a modern man. Okay, the vote is over, and we are now moving on to the interpanel discussion. So, Anya, I saw you scribbling down a few things. I'm unable to read your handwriting, so if you could share it with your audience. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a true MD in that manner. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this argument clearly speaks that, uh, that the CGRP is not specific to headaches uh, that have a correlation to the trigeminal vascular system. And um, therefore, it is unspecific and that does not correlate with the argumentation that that uh, CGFP is an important link in between cluster headache and migraine because that would also link cluster headache and migraine to post-traumatic headache. So, Kwang Po, what are your thoughts on this? I think my answer would be maybe post-traumatic headache disorder also belong to this thing because clearly CGFP does not work against tension type headache and some other headache. As far as I know, that's the job. It only works in post-traumatic, cluster headache, and migraine. So why not just add post-traumatic headache into this thing? Okay, so you would argue that all three of them share the same mechanisms? At least all three of them, they share similar characteristics. For example, like post-traumatic headache, many of the patients, they also have typical migraine features. That is correct. That is an excellent point. 
So I think I, as the moderator, should also let the debaters ask each other questions now. Yes. And Anya, do you have a question uh, for Dr. Peng? Yeah, are we, are we sitting down? We are sitting down. We are sitting down. We are okay. having a nice dinner conversation. Perfect. So um, my first question is that you, you nicely showed all these new imaging studies, and I know that you are the expert group on this new imaging, but there are two studies out there that have not found uh, any replication of the hypothalamic uh, activation uh, in migraine. Do you have any explanation for this? Um, you're definitely right. There's been always some inconsistency among studies based on the methodology, including extrusion criteria. And for example, uh, in the recent review, out of 16 functional imaging studies, 10 studies were positive for hypothalamus and 6 studies were negative for hypothalamus. And to make it even more complicated, the status of cost headache may also influence the functional imaging outcome. For example, episodic versus chronic and inbound versus in remission. But overall, I would argue that positive studies still outweigh negative studies, especially when we talk about functional imaging studies, not structure studies. So there is still some debate that activation of posterior hypothalamus in early study is actually the ventral tendon in the brain. But I believe this has been solved in the latest three Tesla MRI study with a spatial resolution of one to two millimeter. So in summary, I would argue that we still have some inconsistency, but positive studies still always negative studies. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Peng. Anya, do you have any comments on his answer? Well, new imaging is not my, my strongest suit, uh, and I do believe that they show activation, but we do, do not really know what the activation means at the current moment. So we do not know if it's a, a generator, or if it's a terminator, or what this activation initially means for a physiological standpoint yet. Excellent perspective. So, Kuang Po, do you have a question for Dr. Peterson? Yeah, uh, you just saw that the genetic correlation between five and cause a headache is only meaningful when both of them they are strong genetic soldiers. For example, from data from GWA studies consistently found a statistically significant low type, but with a really low clinical impact. I mean like off ratio from 0.9 or 1.1. So I would argue that environmental factor or epigenetic factor are more important. How would you comment on the genetic contribution of, to both disorders? And can we really use the genetic component as an argument that both of them, they are not two distinct disorders? Well, um, I believe that um, it has just been this year where we have published the, the large GVASs on cluster headache, and we have not yet seen uh, the data from the entire consortium. I believe that will be published soon. Um, so I think we are still in an early stage of the genetics, at least for cluster headache. I do believe the result we see in cluster headache is quite robustly. The odds ratios are very high compared to uh, it is a big data, it is uh, a genetics data, it's not a, a, a simple clinical study. And um, in, in migraine, a lot of the... Um, of the there's tons and tons of of GVSs, there's tons of uh, um, <clears throat> of samples, but many of the samples have been uh, collected uh, by swaps, and they are self-reported migraine. So I believe we have a lot of noise to be cleaned up in the migraine. So currently we are speaking about maybe we can um, we can explain twelve percent of migraine from the genetics. I believe this is actually higher it, when we clean up all these uh, all this noise that we see. Thank you, Anja. I know for sure that we have a couple of experts in <laughs> genetics in the audience, so maybe they will add their uh, comments later on when it's their turn. So I have a comment for both, or more like a, a question for both of you. So we, we agree on uh, that CGRP can can, is maybe involved in both disorders. I think both sides agree on this. Is this correct, Kwang Po? Yeah. Yeah, and Anja. Yep. Yeah. And this is largely based on the fact that we can provoke and treat by targeting the CGRP signaling pathway. 
what about, so we also treat, let's say, migraine with antihypertensives. Does that mean that migraine is a disorder of hypertension? Who asked? Who I, was I, first? I, it was for, I think <laughs> I will let uh, you start, Anya. Yeah, so uh, so currently to correct a little bit in your in your intro is uh, we cannot treat a cluster headache by uh, CGP anti stuff antibodies at the moment. I do believe there's an FDA approved uh, antibody for yeah, cluster headache. But we are right now in Denmark and it's not EMA approved. Um for cluster headache at least. It's so not in Europe. Not in Fair Europe. <laughs> and um and it's only a slight positive study. It has not shown a, a great reduction in pain because of a, a fairly high placebo response in the in the galganismab trials. I do believe that that CGRP is important, um, and uh, but it's well we treat everything by these off-label drugs, we just, at some point, somebody had a great idea of the antihypertensive, and then we just tried all of them for migraine, and some of them work. And that it's fantastic, but it doesn't mean we have a, a, a mechanistic answer at the moment. We don't know why they work. Thank you, Anya. And Kwang Po, what are your thoughts? Um, I think when you talk about antihypertensive medication, and it's only one or two, or the some group of them that work against migraine. So the argument is that they are uh, the efficacy against migraine is basically not from the antihypertensive effect. Otherwise, we can also argue that rapamil also has a little bit antihypertensive effect. So are we arguing that antihypertension medication in general can be used to treat cause headache? I believe not. So the problem is just I agree with Anya that the main how this medication works we don't really know about it compared to anti CGRP therapy we know exactly the mechanism of anti CGRP therapy but why propanolol or canvisatin works against migraine I believe uh, until now we don't really know about it yeah thank you. And I will let the debaters ask each other another question, and then we'll move into the audience. So Anya, you may start with one question, and then Kwang Po. Yeah, okay. So um, you have nicely showed all this provocation studies that have been uh, done at the Danish Headache Center, so I, I know quite a few of them. Um, but there is, for at least for me, a, a great difference uh, for the provocation studies in cluster headache and in migraine. In cluster headache, we can simply not provoke anything during the remission. Whereas in migraine, the provocation rate is unaffected if the patient has three attacks per week or three attacks per year. So how can you explain this? Kwang Po? I think uh, that suggests that what's special with cluster headache is not a headache generator. Instead, which region decides the attack should stop? We know that even without intervention, the attack stopped within three hours. The on and off phase for cluster headache is obvious, either for the attack or for the cluster bond. So therefore, study should focus on the binding of the on and off switch. Comparably, migrant patients, they don't have an obvious remission phase. They don't have the specific off switch. So that's probably why they can always be provoked compared to cluster headache. But in an early Danish study from Janssen et al., I think this 2000, he also showed a trend toward a higher induction rate in high frequency migrants. There might still be some differences in this induction rate considering the disease activity but not so obvious as in cluster headache. So when headache attack cannot be provoked specifically in the remission phase, I think the problem is that what is so special with this remission phase? There's something special with cluster headache. But the fact that this uh, provocation can be used in both migraine and both cluster headache, that suggests the mechanism of the headache initiation is somehow similar between both disorders. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Peng. Can I follow up? Nope. No. <laughs> Kwang Po, you may now ask your question. Okay. And in your presentation, you said only one out of four clinical trials found the efficacy of CGRP monoclonal antibody in treating cluster headache. 
there is a strong confounding factor here. The results from episodic and chronic cluster headache is totally different. For example, gaganizumab only works for episodic cluster headache, and for example, something else like a vagus stem stimulation also only works for episodic cluster headache. And when we look into the data on the Verapamil, Verapamil seems to be somehow different from chronic and episodic cluster headache. It works better for episodic cluster headache. If, so in this case, do you think we should specifically differentiate between episodic and chronic cluster headache? Or should we treat them both as a simply cluster headaches? Dr. Peterson? So now you're talking about even subdividing cluster headache as two distinct disorders. Um, when we are, you're supposed to argue that they are combined. But I mean, yes, I believe that a cluster headache um, in its pure form, it is episodic. Uh, we de do see that the, the chronic patients are more hard to uh, differentiate. And going forward in the research, I believe that we should subdivide, and I strongly believe that we should subdivide migraine and cluster headache into two groups, otherwise we cannot learn anything. And we should also subdivide the the episodic and the chronic cluster headache patients because the chronic patients they are they are a bit different they have uh, uh, supposed uh, i suspect that they have some central uh, sensibilization and uh, they are harder to treat thank you for your answer and with that we will now open up for questions from the audience both in person and online and i see a queue is slowly forming up <laughs> Uh, can you see this, Kwangpo? What's happening? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, we will start with the first. Uh, Kwangpo, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, you mentioned triggers, and uh, you mentioned that uh, CGRP provokes uh, uh, mi uh, migraine attacks and CGRP provokes cluster headache attacks. It's correct. But we also know that uh, GTN, nitric oxide donor, provokes cluster headache attacks and provoke migraine attacks and also provoke tension type headache. And uh, apparently uh, having uh, the same mediators, shared same mediators, doesn't mean that you express the disease in the same way. Apparently they expressed in a different way, phenotypically. How, how can you say it is uh, uh, the same if they expressed in the different way? Cluster patients report cluster attacks, tension type headache patients report tension type headache, and migraine patients report migraine attacks, P particularly with the GTN. Thank you, Professor Sheena. Dr. Peng, you may begin. It's a really good question. I asked myself so many times about it. I think uh, my answer would be maybe the trigger for headache attacks from this disorder is somehow similar, but each headache disorder may have a unique disease modulator. For example, we know that from the functional imaging study compares the comparison between migraine and cluster headache, when we look into the brainstem, uh, the brainstem activation is somehow different when we talk about migraine versus cluster headache. I'm not sure about any study with regard to tension type headache. So maybe that's what's specific with this disease phenotype, how long this attacks last and what associated symptoms are present is something to do with the disease modulator, not disease initiator, or at least not the, uh, the headache initiator. So in this way, we will argue that the trigonovascular activation, at least based on the GTN studies, maybe somehow similar among these three disorders. Thank you, Dr. Peng. I think Dr. Just uh, one comment. I think com that uh, <laughs> uh, I would suggest to read uh, one of my papers on tension type headache with the GTN published many years ago in Brain, uh, showing that, that you can, in fact, trigger tension type headache uh, in patients. It was a bit criticized by some of our friends, you know who I'm talking about, uh, uh, that some of these patients might have a migraine, uh, even excluding those with the coexisting uh, once and twice a year of migraine, uh, in the pure, pure tension type headache, we saw that they also report tension type headache. 
And uh, I believe that uh, Professor Rigma Jensen was a co-author of this paper. She can confirm that. But this is just a comment. Uh, so you don't have to address that. Thank you. And next in line. Okay, I'm Nadja. I have a question for both of you, and then I have one specifically for Anya and one for Kwang Po. So the shared question for both of you, like Anya, you touched a bit upon it. So you have a tiger and a lion, but they are both cats, although. So you, s you know, that's an argument you can use it for and against. And di diagnost diagnostic criteria are made from ourselves, like we made them. And then we try to put biology into those criteria. So what does it actually take to say that diseases are distinct? So what does it require to say this is a disease distinct from the other one? Because that's very unclear and it's very uh, vital to the, the discussion. The question for you, Anya. Uh, I think we should start with the shared question first. So okay. So okay. we don't forget what the question was. Yeah. Yeah. So Anya, if you will start and then Kwan Po afterwards. Yes. Yeah, well, all is a matter of perspective in this world and, uh, and biology. And you also saw Kwang Po uh, showing these uh, outliers that doesn't fit in the criteria as an argumentation that they are not the same or that they are the same. But, but we are talking about biology. And we have to say that the majority of the patient actually fits into the criteria. And um, we need the criteria because otherwise, how can we do any research? How can we get any smarter, any wiser on all these headaches if we cannot put people into a box and then investigate them? It might be in a hundred years that we say, they do have the same pathway, they are a, a spectrum, but at the current moment, at the current knowledge, they are not, because we don't have that knowledge. And to gain that knowledge, we have to investigate them as two separate disorders and put them maybe through the same trials, but in different. They have to be grouped with with each other, like they have, we have to investigate cluster headache, and then we can compare the results to migraineurs. That will Thank be you, Anya. Answer. Huang Po, what is your take? And I think the criteria are really important. I'm not against the criteria, but <laughs> the current criteria was not based on biological markers. So maybe in the future, SDHD4 or SDHD5, we have better biomarker for headache disorder. Maybe in the future, in 10 years, 20 years, uh, we have the CGRP-related headaches or PARCAP-related headache instead of only migraine versus cluster headache. So maybe in the future, we can use the one criteria to fit both of them. CGRP headache with a shorter duration, CGRP headache with a longer duration or something else. I'm not sure. Thank you to both of you. I will just take a quick question from the online audience from Ayudini Asuni. Are there any differences in circulating immune marker in both disorders? So I think this is a question for both of you. Um, well, I, I just uh, yesterday was uh, reading an, an old paper by, um, by... You always read, Anja. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> by uh, Dr. Gottsby and was hidden in a paper uh, on Sunt. And there we actually see that they compare the levels of, uh, example, CGRP uh, between uh, cluster headache and migraine. And CGRP is twice the level compared uh, in cluster headache compared to migraine. Kwang Po? I'm not familiar with any specific immunomarkers for cluster headache, but I, as we recall, the immunomarker for migraine, there's some studies about it, but there's no replication study. So I'm not sure the real roles. But when we talk about is a peptide, there's something else. Thank you. And then we'll take questions from the in-person audience again. Continue. May I? Yeah. yeah, you may. OK, so Kwang Po, do you suggest that we future migraine studies will include cluster headache patients? And if not, shouldn't we segregate even further? And that goes to my question to Anya. Isn't cluster headache just a sub-phenotype of migraine that affects women more than men? And I think that put 
both questions into one. Uh, I think any clinical trial is strongly based on the ICAP criteria. In that way, we can have a common language between different study groups and different study sites. So based on the current ICHT criteria, I would say we should not mix cluster headache and migraine patient together. But just like I already said, maybe in the future we have better biomarkers. It might be a good idea to separate them based on the biomarker. In that way, maybe they can be uh, categorized under the same umbrella diagnosis. Thank you. Anya? Well, I, I do not believe that cluster headache is a, a subform of migraine. As, as I said before, they, they look completely different uh, during the attacks. Um, and and migraineurs are they have very there's a lot of variance in when you talk to the patients in cluster headache they are very stereotypical and I believe they are their own, their own group. Thank you. And we have an expert in genetics coming up on the stage, Mona. I'm not sure if I'm going to comment right now on the genetics. <laughs> I'll leave it to the meta analysis soon. But hello. Good to also see not just our backs. My comment, and I was um, wondering if you could comment more about this heterogeneity of both disorders, right? Is it really difficult to, sh to, to try to compare two very heterogeneous disorders? Or should we maybe look into the more subgroups? So my ideas were for the endophenotype, possible endophenotype, migraine with autonomic symptoms. Maybe to be a bit diplomatic for both of you, could those could that actually be a subgroup where they are sharing some components? Anya, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I believe that um, that the autonomic symptoms in migraine have have been discussed, and there's just a recent publication in which they have found seventy percent of all migraineurs to have autonomic symptoms. I myself have not found that many in the in the clinic. But um, I believe they should be a subtype of migraine. They should not be a part of, of the cluster headache uh, simply because they have an autonomic symptom. Because it is less pronounced and they still don't uh, behave like the cluster headache patient. Um, and maybe, I know your cohort is, is very, very strictly... Uh, diagnosed, but maybe there might still be some misdiagnosis in there, so that some of the migraineurs are um, misdiagnosed as cluster headache. Um, we saw in a, in a publication from Lund in 2017 that most of our female cluster headache patients are misdiagnosed uh, with migraine before they receive their actual cluster headache diagnosis. Thank you. And Quang Po, what is your take? Uh, I also suggest that maybe in the future we should separate my patient into different subgroups, but the subgroup differentiation must be based on strong biological markers. I remember reading one article something about a genetic variant associated with treatment response. So maybe we, we need to use the biological marker like CGRP, something else, or even imaging markers to have a better classification of migraine patients into the different subgroups, not only use the phenotype, because phenotype is not really reliable sometimes. And Mona, you have a comment? Just a little comment on this. Uh, very preliminary, we do see results that, especially migraine with autonomic symptoms, that um, this is kind of a link genetically between migraine and cluster headache. But um, I think this is something that could be nice to study in the future, and hopefully both of you could be on board. Thank you. And I think Professor Sheena also have a statement. I have a question. A question? So the question is about the uh, uh, head pain uh, during the migraine and during the cluster headache, and to both of you. Uh, if you just speculate and uh, tell me, where is the site of nociception in cluster headache versus migraine? Where does it hurt when I have a patient with a cluster headache and with a migraine headache? 
This is a very good question, and I will let Anya start off. Well, the clasthetic patient, they hurt in the eye, where the migraine patients, they hurt all around. Uh, it's more diffuse. But are you talking about which nerve we are talking? Yes. Pathophysiology, yeah. So I believe that, um, that that cluster headache is way more centrally driven. So they are um, a part of the start, as you also showed the, uh, the, the, the snore study. They feel restless before the attacks are coming on. So the, the debut of the attack is centrally. And um, the pain will be uh, within the trigeminal vascular reflex in cluster headache. Thank you for your answer, Anya. Kwang Po? Um, for me, cluster headaches is rather more specific to the V1 dermatome. And for migraine, it's also V1 dermatome, but more like to, to involve the, the whole head, not only in the V1 dermatome. But uh, there's some studies suggesting that for cluster headache, it's more like to uh, more likely to involve the V2 and V3 dermatome compared to the migraine. I'm not sure if it has something to do with the transgenomal autonomic activation in cluster headache. There's maybe something specific with cluster headache. And just like we don't see so many, so many cranial autonomic symptoms in patients with migraine, and those with the CAS, they're more likely to have a bilateral CAS compared to unilateral CAS. Thank you. We'll take two last questions, one from the online audience and then one in person. So we have one from the online audience, from Ayudeji Asuni. Can you say anything about the re resolution of both disorders with age? And I believe this is a question for both of you. And Anya, you may begin. Well, this is uh, also a question that I hear a lot from my patients. Um, we know that, uh, that uh, the migraine is going down after the menopause for many of the female sufferers. Uh, I also saw a study yesterday that the male uh, uh, migraineurs, they are more likely to just go on with their, with their migraine. We don't know that much about cluster headache and the resolution yet. Uh, that is a study that is very much needed, a prospective study that will show us the, the the life span of this awful disease. Thank you, Anya. Kwang Po? Uh, I would say that there's something we didn't discuss today is the hormones. The, the hormone has some really specific role in migraine, but maybe not so much in cancer headache. As we know that before the puberty, patient with the male and female patient, they have similar incidence of migraine. But after puberty, is much higher in women, but not in men. But after menopause, the incidence of prevalence of migraine is also um, significantly dropped after menopause. So I think that's something we didn't observe in patients with cause headaches. So I would assume the role of the hormone plays a specific role, specifically in migraine, but not in cause headache. Thank you for your answer. And we have time for one last question from Professor Jensen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Excellent uh, discussion and debate. Uh, I'm just still puzzling, puzzled about the gender uh, sex differences because if if it's so pronounced in cluster headache, it's so pronounced that females are predominant in, in migraine. Uh, so could it be that that the estrogens, the female uh, sex hormones, are protective for, for cluster headache and the other way around. So is there something there? We see, see shift with, uh, with you change gender uh, from men to women and the other way around. So is there a relation between the sex hormones and the, the different headache types? Kwang Po, I think she was primarily directing this at you because she was looking at the screen while she was asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, hormone is definitely one specific benefit. The other one is the sex itself, because for the pharmacological study for amyline and adrenal amyline, there's some animal models show clear differences between female and male rats. So, uh, to my knowledge, until now, there's no really good animal model for cause headache. 
I think that's something we need in the future to better answer these questions. Thank you. Professor Jensen, do you have a follow-up? Anja? I do believe that uh, that estrogen seems to be a, a, a factor that will escalate migraine. <laughs> it will, and it does not seem to do that in uh, in, in cluster headache at all. It doesn't seem to be effective there. Okay. Thank you to both of you, and I think that was it for the Q and A session. Now, both of you have two minutes each to present your closing statements. And Anya, you may start. So please stand oh, up. I'll stand up. I'll take my mic. So um, this has been an interesting debate, and uh, I believe that, uh, and I, I believe the same as uh, when I arrived, that they are two different disorders. And I believe that you should not focus in on the, all the similarities. This is what we do in research. We go into all these small, small details, but you need to put on the big, the big zoom, and you need to go stand away from it, and you need to see they are. They look different. We have to at least investigate them differently. Um, we need separately designs um, to to catch uh, the effect in clinical studies. One is a man. One is a female. This is two different, completely separate disorders. Thank you, Dr. Peterson and Dr. Peng. You may provide your closing statement. I used a slide from Anja to summarize. You saw in the beginning that there's this comparison between the lion and the tiger. There's a good example, and just like the comparison between migraine and cluster headache. Lions and tigers, they are not the same animals, but they share 98% of their genome. They are definitely much more similarity than disparity. When we talk about lions versus mosquitoes, they are de definitely two distinct animals. But an older similarity between migraine and cluster headache the relationship between migraine and cross I would say, is just like lions and tigers. So not lions versus mosquito. In this case, I would say, please vote no, please vote again this motion. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Peng, and I to both debaters. So I think we went through most of the animal kingdom today. So right now, we are entering the final vote. Krone, if you may. So just as before, I would like you all to go on iCamps2022.com and log into the chat where you are able to cast your vote. If you click the vote button, you will have the option to cast a vote for or against the motion. And again, the motion is migraine and cluster headache are two distinct disorders for or against. While we're waiting for the last uh, round of votes. So, Kwangpo, did your wife come back with your children yet? Uh, not yet. Not yet, not yet. So you can't get those extra votes from your family. What about you, Anya? Is your family watching this? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be the show. No, um, no, my daughter has a five-year-old birthday tomorrow. So my, uh, she's with uh, her grandparents and my husband is cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> I can say uh, you both of you have amazing partners that are supporting you in <laughs> this session, and I think they should also get a little applause for supporting you. Yes. I think we can all agree on having a supporting partner, especially in science, is important. Oh, maybe not in science, just in life in general. So, Rune, how is the vote? Are we getting ready? So it appears that the vote has ended. And now we come just in one minute. We'll have the results on the screen. So, Anja, how was the debate? Did you enjoy it? Yes, very much. Very interesting. Always happy to discuss cluster headache. <laughs> and what about you, Kwang Po? Did you enjoy the format? It's really, it's really interesting. Thanks a lot. It's my pleasure to be here. And we are just glad that you could participate Unfortunately, so the plan was originally to have Kwang Po in person here, but due to travel restrictions, we unfortunately had to convert it into a online meeting.
So it appears that the vote is ready. So let's look at the results from round one. Okay, so <laughs> before, before any opening remarks, 85% of the <laughs> voters were for the motion and 15% were against the motion. After the opening remarks, the results were the following. Some might say a bit more balanced. 57% for the motion and 43% against the motion. So again, it just demonstrates that discussion is important in science. And let's have the final vote count. After the discussion, we tipped a bit back to the prior distribution. 70% of the audience were for the motion and 30% were against the motion. So everybody, thank you for participating in today's debate and congratulations to Dr. Peterson for getting the majority and congratulations to Dr. Ping for shifting votes during the debate. Thanks to both debaters and thanks to the audience.